When he passed away in 2019, Johnny Kitagawa was the foremost figure in the world of J-pop. As the head of Japan's most influential talent agency, Johnny & Associates, Kitagawa was responsible for launching the careers of some of the most beloved Japanese pop groups over the past 50 years, and for that, he's still respected to this day. But beyond the glamour of his career lies a series of disturbing and horrible actions that traumatized multiple male idols. Johnny Kitagawa founded Johnny & Associates in 1962, and with its founding, the genre of J-pop and idol culture were also created. This started when Kitagawa traveled to Japan from the United States so he could work at the United States Embassy and ran into a group of young men who played baseball together at Yoyogi Park back in the 60s. Kitagawa became a coach for a team of young men, which was made up of four childhood friends, Ino Osami, Aoi Teruhiko, Nakatani Dyo, and Mae Hiromi. The four were invited by Johnny to watch the movie West Side Story at his residence, and the movie inspired them so much that that they decided to take up dancing. That's how Johnny and Associates first group was created, called Johnny's. Keep this in mind for later. The group became unexpectedly successful as Kitagawa used the then innovative approach of combining attractive performers who sang popular music with synchronized dance routines. The Johnny's made history as the first all-male pop group in Japan. But why did this group specifically become so famous? Well, the Johnny's were literally the OG Asian idol group from the 60s that set the bar for all idol groups that came after. What made them so special was their epic combo of singing and theatrical dancing. Sure, there were teen idols and all-male singing groups before them, like the Three Funkies, but the Johnnies took it to a whole new level. It was a groundbreaking fusion of music and dance that paved the way for generations of idol groups to come. Kitagawa wasn't the one who came up with the concept of boy bands, but he was one of the first big shot figures to realize that he could make them from scratch without any real musical talent. In fact, musical talent was probably even a hindrance to his strategy. The group led to the creation of the term Johnny's, which eventually became a generic term for any of the performers who were signed under Kitagawa. He was a man who stuck to his formula for years and years, even during times when it wasn't trendy, and he never gave up on his dream of creating a wildly successful musical group. His determination really paid off as Kitagawa became a master at creating iconic bands that would steal the hearts of fans everywhere. He would start by holding open auditions to find talented musicians, only boy trainees though, not girls or women as he claimed that men are easier to handle. He would then train these boys in singing and dancing. The trainees really had to impress Kitagawa so that they could turn from background dancers to pop idols. The approved candidates resided in a dormitory provided by the company and received education at a school managed by the same company. Once the bands were formed, he would make sure that they became cultural sensations by getting them on TV variety shows, hosting concerts, and selling tons of records. It was a winning formula that turned unknown artists into superstars, a form which is still used to this day. Little did everyone know that something quite disturbing was happening behind the closed doors of Johnny's dorms. He got his first taste of unbelievable success after he debuted his second group, Four Leaves. The Four Leaves were insane on stage. They brought their A-game by adding acrobatics and even elements of rhythmic gymnastics to their singing and dancing performances. It was a totally unique style that no one else was doing in 1973 or anywhere else for that matter. Through his company and the groups that came out of it, Kitagawa actually started the idol trainee system that's still used in industries like J-pop and K-pop. Some of his most popular groups were Adashi, Smup, Katun, Heisei Jump, among others. However, he appeared super strict about everything his performers did. He wouldn't even let their pictures be on the company website. Basically, the bands he produced had to act a certain way so that they could cater to young women. That meant that they couldn't talk about their personal lives in public. Kitagawa was like that too. He almost never let anyone take his picture, and he never showed up in public with the groups that he managed. But despite his ways of management, to say that he was an important figure in the Asian entertainment industry would be quite an understatement. As it always is with the entertainment industry, there was a dark side behind the perfection on stage. The allegations against Kitagawa date back to the 1990s, with one ex-member of Four Leaves, Kita Koji, went on to publish a series of diaries with the title Dear Hikaru Genji. This book spoke in disturbing detail about the time Koji met Kitagawa, the relationship between the two, and Kita's addiction to illegal substances. According to Koji, he was scouted by Kitagawa himself as he was attending a performance at Johnny's and the two started living together soon after. This was when Kitagawa started touching Koji and making advances at him without his consent, a behavior that continued for four and a half years on a nightly basis. Koji wrote, We were living the lives of a married couple more so than lovers, saying that he felt satisfied at the time by the love that he was getting from Johnny. Koji blindly trusted and supported Johnny, though he started saying no to his 
his advances when he became a top idol through Four Leaves. But Johnny wasn't worried too much, as he started getting more interested in boys that were younger than Koji, like Hiromiko, Toyokawa Doe, and Mayo Kawasaki. These boys were all teenagers. Then came the book Johnny's No Gyakutsu by Johnny's member Nakatani Do, which was published in October of 1989. He went and wrote about the experience of being Kitagawa's first known victim and how enraged he felt towards Kitagawa himself. In the book, Nakatani claimed that as the coach of the baseball team, Kitagawa would invite the four of them to go to his house where they would have snacks, toys, and audio equipment. But there was a sinister intention behind the invitations as Nakatani tragically found out. He said that one day when he went to Kitagawa's house by himself, he was told, if you do this, it feels good, while Kitagawa would touch him inappropriately without his consent. The other three victims were treated similarly, but none of them saw themselves as victims at the time, joking that Johnny is just another strange old man. Nakatani said that he didn't know what was going on, so he didn't really feel hurt at the time, sharing. When I got older, I realized how different my experience was from other people's. That came as a huge shock to me. Nearly a decade after Hikaru Genji was published, more specifically in 1996, Junya Hiramoto was also an idol under the company who came out with his own book. In it, he claims that he witnessed Kitagawa force himself on one of the male trainees in one of the dorms. Naturally, these accusations were quickly swept under the rug. Kitagawa was powerful enough and had some big connections for these stories to get buried before they even got the chance to hit the news. A member of one of his boy bands, Moritago of V6, was allegedly accused of hurting an actress, but since he was under Kitagawa's agency, he was never convicted. According to media analysts and reporters, Kitagawa had full control of what the media said about him or his boy groups, which was something everyone complied to. Rumors about Johnny Kitagawa's inappropriate relations with teenage boys had been circulating for a considerable period, making it an open secret within the Japanese entertainment industry. Yet nobody dared to speak out against him due to his power. That was until Shukan Bunsun, one of Japan's largest magazines, had started publishing a series of articles in which they accused Kitagawa of taking advantage of his trainees in exchange for a chance at stardom. The articles contained interviews with about a dozen teenage boys who had talked about their experiences with Kitagawa. One of them said that Kitagawa would burst into his room, take advantage of him, and he wouldn't even dare to look because he was so scared. He said, In the morning when I woke up, there was $500 which had been placed by my bed. Mr. Kitagawa also hurt another junior who lived in the same dorm. I can give you his name as well. When asked why they endured this, which is not a question that you should be asking to victims who were taken advantage of so horribly, one of the boys getting interviewed answered, If you say no to Mr. Johnny, the fact is, you'll never get to appear on stage. You'll never get to be famous. Your group will never get to debut. You'll be letting down your bandmates. The victims were also told by their seniors to put up with everything or that they wouldn't have a chance at succeeding. The public was shaken by the articles, which contained vivid depictions of the things that Johnny did to these young male trainees. But again, Kitagawa was way too powerful to be taken down. Johnny and associates refused the request for promotional photos and interviews with the acts that they managed and went on to file a libel suit in 2002. The allegations made by the magazine against Mr. Kitagawa and his lawsuit weren't covered by any other significant news outlet in Japan at the time. Additionally, the tell-all books written by Johnny's juniors claiming that they were young boys and how Kitagawa coerced them and others into inappropriate activities were never mentioned by the publications. However, during a lawsuit in the early 2000s, the Japanese high court found that he had mistreated his young male talent in inappropriate ways while they were living in the dorms or elsewhere. Although some accusations of supplying alcohol and cigarettes were dismissed, the Supreme Court rejected his appeal. Unfortunately, Kitagawa's industry influence kept people from speaking out against him, and the mainstream media was hesitant to criticize him. The idols were too afraid to put a stop to his behavior in fear of losing the chances to have a career in the industry. Although the civil court case confirmed that children had indeed been hurt, the statute of limitations had expired, making it impossible to pursue a criminal case. Nevertheless, the truth had eventually been revealed. The head of Japan's most significant and prominent music industry had repeatedly committed heinous acts against young vulnerable boys. Unfortunately, Kitagawa passed away in 2019 without ever facing repercussions for what he did to the boys who had joined his company. In fact, his passing was followed by a tribute concert at Tokyo Dome, which featured more than 150 of his artists. Even when he passed away, Kitagawa was very much present across Japan, with the faces of his artists and idols being plastered on billboards and merchandise. If you thought that the case would rest once Kitagawa was gone, you thought wrong. The same month Kitagawa passed away, Shunkan Bunshun revealed that another former Johnny Jr. had claimed that Kitagawa had been his first kiss. But because the anonymous trainee had rejected his advances, he was put at the very corner of the stage during performance. 
performances. Two years after that, in January 2021, former member of Seven Man Samurai, Koki Maeda, told Arama Japan that it was for sure that Kitagawa had inappropriate relationships with Johnny's Juniors because he had the privilege of deciding who deserved to debut. Mere moments after the interview was made public, Maeda retracted his statement. Shukan Bunsun didn't stop seeking justice for the victims, as they spent March of 2023 talking to six alleged victims of Kitagawa. More recently, former Johnny's Jr. member Kawan Okamoto was the brave person who has been speaking at length to the media outlets. The articles talk about how Johnny invited Okamoto to dinner in Tokyo and then told him to stay in his condo in Shibuya. Nothing happened at the time as they both slept in different bedrooms. The peace didn't last for long though, as in March of 2012, Okamoto was inappropriately used. He was just about to graduate junior high school when one night, Kitagawa massaged his shoulders and told him to go to bed early. This is what he would do. He would put the boys to bed and hurt them. Okamoto would pretend to be asleep while he did it, while Kitagawa did this for over an hour two days in a row, then pretended that nothing happened. During his four-year term with Johnny's Jr., he was hurt about 15 to 20 times until he quit. Also recently, BBC premiered a documentary on March 7th titled Predator, The Secret Scandal of J-Pop, in which journalist Moby and Ozhar investigates Kitagawa's history of coercion and misconduct. They spoke with former trainees of the company about what experiences they had. A former idol trainee who claims to have been a victim of Kitagawa says, He came to our house. Even with my parents sleeping in the next room, he made me suffer. Another one shared that only a week after he first met with Kitagawa, he was invited to stay at one of his houses. It was known as the dormitory because a lot of boys would sleep over. In these dorms, they had no other parental supervision and would be offered alcohol and cigarettes. He said, Johnny Kitagawa approached me and said, go take a bath. He washed my whole body as if I were his doll. But the sinister part of just how traumatic Kitagawa's actions are is that despite everything that went on, almost everyone that spoke out about their horrifying experience has expressed to be very grateful to Johnny about the opportunities that he gave them in the industry. Just like Nakatani Dyo, who didn't realize what had been going on until years later, that seems to also be the case with the other trainees and idols who were victims of Kitagawa. In BBC's documentary, the graduates from Kitagawa's dormitory smile brightly and say that they love him, stating that they understand that there had to be some kind of payment for being a star. One of them says, he didn't get me that much, while the other claims, I still think we were treated with love. It's devastating to see the mechanics of how certain individuals manipulate their victims, shedding light on the intricate psychological dynamics involved. It was devastating to see how Kitagawa's actions not only inflicted trauma and harm on countless young boys, but also perpetrated a culture of misusing power and secrecy within the entertainment industry. What do you think about this twisted story? Share your thoughts in the comments and thank you for watching. Bye!